scripture reading today in God's Word is 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12. <coughs> For I do not want to be ignorant of the facts, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from getting, setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan reverie. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one <coughs> day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them, as examples were written down as warnings for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So be it. How about now? Okay, is that better? Okay. And um, I went to two of the classes that David Phelps teaches, if you know who he is. If you ever listen to Moody and they ask the attorney a question, that's him. So I listened to most of his, or two of his times and learned a lot of things. One thing that I found interesting, and he always did this, he said, how many of you here today believe that we fight a spiritual battle? Raise your hand. You know, and he just did that all day long, you know, people doing stuff. And he started out with, you know, we'd fight one, and times have a change, but the devil is still that scary old liar and deceiver, isn't he? Trying to steal worship from God. He said the founder of Awanas went out on their first camping trip, whatever, and the guy took 200 boys with him. With him, not with a bunch of other people, with him. That was acceptable then. Could you imagine if we did that today? And he got back from the camping trip and stuff, and the parents were there, and they're like, uh, wait a minute, we got more parents than we got kids. Had six cents of parents that didn't have kids for them. So he got back in the canoe, rowed back over to the lake, found them and stuff, brought them back to their parents. Now, what do you think would happen if that happened today? What do you think happened then? 
Those kids all went home, got their butts paddled, and had to write an apology letter to him for not following his directions and everything. My, how times have changed. We fight a spiritual battle. Next week you get to have a blessing when Nick comes up and pray for us at the walk and everything. I'm going to be preaching Christ boldly there and he's going to be preaching Christ boldly here. His message is Jesus is in the house. And if you know him anything, he's going to be Jesus is in the house. He will be 70 on his next birthday. I just hope and pray that I have the enthusiasm and energy that he has and the love for God that he has at his point in life. And you might have heard me talk a few weeks ago about a post in paper. He's from Lewiston paper. Um, there was a post in the religious section or religion section. And it was quite appalling to what we believe as our doctrine, our statement of faith. And basically what was said from this pastor was that God's not the only God. Jesus is not the only way. The Bible is not the true Word of God. It, it should be looked at, but it's not the inherent Word of God. Um, that Christians are bigots and hypocrites. That evolution takes place. That He welcomes any other religions to come in because you have just as valid experiences as Him and He'll incorporate it in His teachings. This is what some main line denominations teach. And Jacob got to talk to someone yesterday that knew him from the same background. We'll just say that way. I don't want to put too much in there. And he said, I'm not surprised at all. He said, that's commonplace in this. I don't want to say denomination again, but I just said it, didn't I? And it's everywhere. Don't be fooled. We fight a spiritual battle. So today's sermon is inspired by that because I want to tell you what this Word of God says and that it is 100% true. There are no fallacies in it whatsoever. It's not outdated anything else. And if all of creation worships God, then are we as the song says? I will. I hope you will. Because nothing at all has changed. This word is completely true. And there was a God who created you, did create you, that chose to redeem you, that did it at the cost of His Son. And when you look back at the Old Testament, you don't see a different God. You see a jealous God, as Scriptures describe it. And I guarantee you, that if some guy comes in here and starts hitting on my wife, you're going to see a jealous husband. Because I want her love and affection. I married her. She made a covenant to me. And if we say that we believe in God, then we're making a covenant with Him. As the Scripture says, just because the Israelites walked through the parted water and took part in the spiritual food, the manna, but the, they call it spiritual food is what Paul's calling it, and took part in the, the water that come from the rock, and that rock is Christ, they were all baptized into that faith. But not all of Abraham are Abraham, are they? Not all who say this is church preach the same doctrine. And we need to be careful. So next week you'll probably get a little more of the same of this. I'm not sure. But Jesus will be in the house. And don't forget it's Pastor Appreciation Month. I'm not saying it for me. I'm saying it for you make Him feel appreciated and welcome. He is a great man that I'm honored to be brought together with. He's also a hurt man that has been hurt from the church. And he doesn't have a home church right now. So you love on him and let him know how loved he is and how much his message means to you. And I've told him also, calm it down just a little bit. Slow down just a little bit so you don't lose everybody. He said, you know, my wife tells me the same thing. I said, so does mine. Join the club. <laughs> so you'll have Jesus in the house next week. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 because we're going to start there. We're going to see who this God of the Bible really is. Who God says He is. If you don't know anything about Scripture, you've got the textual information. The Scriptures have test 
stood the test of time. I don't care which version you're reading. The message is the same. I don't care if you see that in your notes that some of this text may or may not be in some manuscripts. doesn't matter if the story's in there or not. The story, the whole story is the same from beginning to end. There is a mighty, powerful, omniscient God that is in control of everything, makes no mistakes, doesn't pick up mistakes or coincidences and works with them. He formed you in, his mo- in your mother's womb. He knew exactly the time and season that you would be born. And He knew if you would follow Him or not. And by you following Him, you'll give Him praise and honor and glory that He deserves. And even if you don't, you'll give Him praise and honor and glory because He'll still use you. He used Judas. He used Pharaoh. The thing is, is you want to be on the right side of the equation, right? So in Genesis 1, we start His story. I've said that before. It's history, but it's His story. Genesis 1, 1 says, In the beginning, who? God. That's what it's about. In the beginning, God. This all-powerful, all-knowing, timeless, sovereign God that created you. You are a created being. You're not a God. You're not a fallen God, a fallen angel. You were created by God for His pleasure. Not because He needed you, but because He desired to have a relationship with you. That alone should make us bow down in reverence, fear, praise. Correct? But we know what we did, and we all did. We can't blame it on Adam or Eve. We all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. If you keep reading and get down to verse 23, you'll see that it's the fifth day of creation has occurred. So day six is coming up next. And I'm skimming through this and then I'm going to read some. So don't worry, I'm not going to hopefully lose you. We get down to verse 25. It says, God saw that it was good. If you look through the scripture there, you'll see repeatedly, God saw that what He did was good. Okay? Then something happens in day six. In the middle of day six, we get this, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. And we take that and run with it and think that we're something we're not. We might be the pinnacle of creation to bring God's sovereignty in this creation, but we still have to follow the rules of our Creator. We still have responsibilities. And we still have consequences for our sin. We are created in His image, our image, our likeness, and giving ruling power and authority over this world to take care of it. Just a little less than angels, but above the other creations on the earth with a responsibility to God. With emotions, intellect, will, body, soul, and spirit that the other created things don't have. And a choice whether we're going to honor God or not. As the song says, the stars do, the, the mountains do, the seas do, the rest of the animals do. But do you? Because you have a choice whether you do or not to worship God. Then we get to verse 31. All the other days so far have said, God saw that it was good. But now you're going to read something different. God saw all that He made and it was very good. Because He made man in His image, in His likeness, with a choice to worship Him or not. And all of creation is watching, saying, what's going to happen with this mankind? Are they going to follow God or not? And then probably when sin came in the world, they were like, what's going to happen now? And God's like, watch. Because as Jesus said in John 12, Father, glorify Your name. He says, I have, I am, I will. Period. And all of creation is watching that to see what this God of ours does. <clears throat> Turn to chapter 2. Now, before I start reading chapter 2, remember in the original text, we don't have chapters, we don't have the punctuation and stuff. In my opinion, we're still reading chapter 1 because there's seven days of creation and we haven't got through with it yet. So I'm going to continue reading Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 as a continuation of chapter 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. 
By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Not because he was tired, but because he already knew that mankind would choose to sin. And he's showing them, telling them that he will give them rest. Not only are their bodies designed to have rest, and if you keep on working seven days a week and everything, you'll see what your body does. He said, you need to rest. And on that day when you do rest, remember that it's holy. Remember that I'm the one that created you, that breathed breath into your lungs, the one that gave you everything. It's not by your work or labor that you have food. It's by my grace that you are able to have food. By my grace that you have children. By my grace that you have oxygen to breathe. So he wants us to remember that. Seven days of creation with a day of rest built in. Just as God himself did. <clears throat> Even before sin came, God knew all these things and had this plan of rest. Which involved a plan of redemption through the sacrificial love of His only Son. Wow. If you notice so far, everything that we've read said this is what God did. Now here comes verse 4 of Genesis chapter 2. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God, we see a new side of God that we haven't seen before in chapter 2. Chapter 1, we see a creator. Chapter 2, we see a creator that demands lordship because of what he has done. Mankind is accountable. There is no, oh, I can live my life however I want to. No. You were designed to make a choice to follow God's rules or not and then give Him glory and honor with your life if you do. If you don't, He's still going to get glory and honor. The problem is, is then you'll spend eternity apart from Him. The Lord God... If you continue reading verse 5, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, and so on, you'll see the Lord God. Now go to chapter 3. Starting in verse 1. Now the serpent, the devil, that, that liar from old, we'll see that in Revelations, uh, it was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Lord God. He said to the woman, Did God... Because he doesn't recognize God as Lord. He rebelled. He made the choice. He still recognizes God as creator of all things. That's a fact. Can't change that. And it's still a fact that he's Lord God. But Satan doesn't believe it. He's a deceiver, the father of all lies. Wants to steal your worship for his own. Did God really say... And he projected that thought to the woman because watch what, he sa what she says after. She says, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God... Wait a minute. There's no Lord there again because she's choosing to disobey God. But God did say you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it if or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. <clears throat> what happened? Yeah, we know, don't we? Disobedience, lack of worship and praise for God. Taking glory and honor from God and giving it to Satan. No, I'm not going to give it to Satan when I disobey. Yeah, you are. That's exactly what you do when you disobey God. If the Lord is not, Lord God is not your Lord and God, then you serve another master. Jesus is pretty clear about it. If you read through the Old Testament, it's clear. You cannot serve two masters. So let's read on. In verse 8 of Genesis 3, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God. Didn't change who the Lord was, whether they obeyed or disobeyed or not. He's still the Lord God of this story, of his story. 
They heard the sound of the Lord God as He was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Instead of God, our Lord, walking away, destroying us because of His nature, because of His intended purpose, because of His glory, which He will continue to make known to all of creation, He was faithful. We weren't, but He was. God does not change. And boy, that's such a ah, relief and security, isn't it? That He does not change. No matter what a preacher gets up here and preaches and says, He come from here. It doesn't change. God doesn't change. His Word doesn't change. Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. And He has provided a way of escape for you. Not just from the trials of this world, but from eternal death and separation from Him. And it was written in red in blood in Jesus Christ. Verse 14 says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Still the Lord God, not God said, Lord God said to the serpent, <coughs> It reminds me of John chapter 12, verse 12. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. So what happens in the next chapter? The Lord God continues to be faithful, even though mankind is not. If you go to Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says, Adam made love to his wife. This was the plan from the beginning. That covenant of marriage was given by God as a blessing before sin ever came into this world. One man, one woman for life. With a blessing of having children and the other things that go along with getting there. <laughs> and it's supposed to be a good, perfect relationship. Children are a blessing and heritage from the Lord. All these wonderful things. And this plan is still in effect because that's what God said. So Adam made love to his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, even in her fallen state, she realized what a good, gracious, loving God that had created her. With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now if you notice the word changed from God to this God is our Lord, so we can just call Him Lord from here out. Because that's who He is. We've established He created all things. We've established that even though we sinned, He was still faithful and just. So for that reason, He is my Lord. And He will provide a way of salvation for me. And the Hebrew says that faith in the Old Testament is the same way. Even though Jesus Christ had not physically come, they still believe by faith of the hope and things that would come. But now we have seen what came. We have the miracles. We have proof of His testimony. We have history that tells us the same thing. We have an empty tomb. No other religion can say that. Because whoever their hope is in, that, gra that grave is full. Our grave is empty. And we won't remain in the grave. What a mighty, awesome God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. So let's fast forward a little bit to Deuteronomy 6 and see what God's laws were. And let's see if we're following them the way that we should. Starting in verse 1, if you have an NIV Bible, there's a header there and it's a good header. It says, Love the Lord your God. We've already seen the establishment of law and everything, but we've got more here. And don't forget that God has chosen a people, a nation, to glorify His name, to bring glory and honor and praise to Him, so that the other nations will see that and come to saving knowledge. He's even rescued them from slavery and bondage. And they've done nothing but grumble, as 1 Corinthians 10 says, besides their disobedience. I don't know about you, but if my child disobeys, that bothers me, yes. And then when they continually disobey, it bothers me even more. But then when they grumble about me, 
putting food in, on their plate and clothing them and giving them a place to stay, that I've made these oppressive rules, then I really get mad. And if you read that passage in 1 Corinthians 10, and by the way, that's where we're at tonight if you want to come. You know, it says, the third thing says, they grumbled and God spread their bodies out across the desert. I don't know. That just hit me when I read that. God demands that we recognize Him as Lord for who He is and what He's done. Romans 12.1 says that that's our proper worship. That's why Paul says, I beg you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, it makes total sense, your reasonable act of service. Worship. Be transformed. We can't stay the same. We've got to be changed. Scripture tells us that we're a new creation in Christ. The old is dead and gone. It died with Christ in the, day, in the grave. And if you believe you're born again, a new creation in Christ, to do good works, to let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's what we're called to do. Well, here's what it says in Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, so that you, get this, your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God. Are we doing that? I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, no. Because if we did, the church wouldn't be in the state that it's in. We have let Satan get a foothold. We have got distracted by the things of this world. We've taken our focus off of God, not done the things He said. And so we're in the state we're in and our children suffer because of us. Because we're not doing what it says here. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord as long as you live by keeping all His de decrees and commands that I give you. So that you may enjoy long life. Look at the promises of this God. He never forsakes us. He never leaves us. He continues to provide mercy and grace. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. I think Jesus might have said something similar, huh? And I think even the, the teacher of the law that he asked answered that question and he remembered the second one even to love your neighbor and Jesus said that all of the Old Testament all the things of the prophets hinged on this this was a pivotal point <clears throat> love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your strength these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts impress them on your children talk about them when you sit at home when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. But instead, as 1 Corinthians says, we grumble. Jacob said the other day, they got a vinyl cutter thing. He said he was going to take some vinyl and put it on the doorpost. I was like, yay! <laughs> Just something that small... Because Scripture says it is so significant to remind you when you go in that home that God is going to be the center of that home. So when you come home and you've been arguing with your wife and stuff, not say they are, I need to put it on my door frame. Go back to me. And you've been arguing stuff and then you say, oh, who gave me the bumper sticker? Was it Doug that put the bumper sticker on my truck? Were you the one that did it? Yeah. It's on the door of my house because I have a metal door. So I see it every time I go there and know that that's what I am supposed to profess. So I put it on my door. I didn't just take it off and not put it somewhere, just so you know. I don't think you've been to the house since then. That if we profess, what it, which verse is it? Acts? I think it's Acts 4.12, but I'm not sure which one it is. Anyway, it's on the door of my house so that I see it as a reminder every time I go in. 
And there have been times where I've been mad and stuff and saw that and like, okay. Yep, you hit me right there with your word. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by your word and truth. Don't go to bed at angry, you know. Love and honor your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church. Oh, all these things come back from seeing one scripture on my door. So, fast forward a little bit further and go to the book of Isaiah. Start in chapter 1. If you know what it is, Isaiah is a voice crying out, no one's listening to him by now. This is Israel's history. Verse 1 says, Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manager, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Go to Isaiah 43. Verse 10 says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, or the NLT says, I, yes I, am the Lord. And apart from me there is no Savior, there is no hope, there is no joy, there is no peace. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I, and not some foreign God among you, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from the ancient days I am He. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? Go to the next chapter in Isaiah 44, verse 6. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first, and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Next chapter, Isaiah 44, verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me there is no God. I will strengthen you. Though you have not acknowledged me even. Wow. So that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create the darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. You heavens above, rain down my righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness flourish with it. The Lord have created it. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but pot sheards among pot sheards on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, oh, what are you making? <laughs> That's absurd, isn't it? <sighs> and still God is faithful. And this is what he goes on to say later in that same chapter, verse 22. Turn to me and be saved. How many times can this Old Testament God that scattered the bodies of His people across the desert say, if you just turn to Me, the choice is in your hands. If you would just turn to Me, choose this day whom you will serve. Blessings or cursings, life or death. Turn to Me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. Not just Israel, but all of mankind. Because God came to a nation to declare Himself to all the other nations. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity, all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. I think we're going to see that again about Jesus too, aren't we, if we keep reading. They will say, in the Lord alone our deliverance is our deliverance and strength. All who have raised against Him will come to Him and be put to shame. So we're seeing a delivery method being foretold here of Jesus Christ. 
And then in Isaiah 53, we know that chapter, here's what it says about this deliverer, foretold hundreds of years before Jesus Christ came. And Merle and I were talking about this morning, and I don't know the exact numbers, but eight prophecies, if you fulfilled them, would the probability would be if you put silver dollars in the state of Texas, which is huge, it'd be two foot deep. Did I get, did I get that right? That's how big the number is, so you can equate it in size. Two foot deep in silver dollars in the state of Texas of fulfilling eight of the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus fulfilled a lot more than that. And He's still going to fulfill prophecies. He did not reign on the throne of David. There will come a time when He will reign on the throne of David. You better believe it because God said it. In Isaiah 53 it says this, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before them like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to Him. Nothing in His appearance that we should desire Him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, He was despised. And we held Him in low esteem. Surely He took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered Him punished by God stricken by Him and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him. And by His wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on Him, Jesus, the iniquity, sin of us all. You and I. These words are written to a rebellious, sinful people, a nation. They're also written to a rebellious, sinful people, all of us today. And that includes the church, unfortunately, and that's the way it's going to be. Read your epistles again. I'm writing you this letter so that you won't sin. And you need to straighten up and do this or that. I'm paraphrasing again, of course. To God be the glory. He makes His covenants. He doesn't break them. And if this new covenant is written in the blood of His only Son, then what do you think the consequences are going to be on that day of judgment? John 14, 6, Jesus makes this claim. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How you can say there's other ways, other religions, it all leads to heaven is absurdity and a lie from the devil. Period. Don't let anyone ever tell you any different. And go back to this word, period. No matter whether it's me or whoever it is. And Acts 4.12 says, is that the verse, Doug? I think that is the verse. It's on my door. <laughs> Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Skip to Galatians. This is a letter Paul writes to one of the churches, starting in verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, the apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you before, the one of Jesus Christ, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, our Lord? Remember that back from Genesis. Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, that means I was at one time. Oh, we're back to John 12 again, aren't we? They believed, some believed, some wouldn't after all the signs. But some would believe, but were worried more about man's praise and glory. So they wouldn't profess it rather than God's. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant or slave of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not 
of human origin. It's from God. So you don't have to worry about it changing. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Whether I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ, who made the claim clearly that He is God. Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm not going to make it all the way to Revelation. I'm going to Hebrews. Starting in verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, sisters, since we have confidence... Confidence complete and secure to enter the most holy place. How? By the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is His body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Not far away, but near where we belong, where we were created, created in the first place. Let us do it with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as the day, you see the day approaching. I believe we're closer than we were yesterday. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. No plan B. No other way. But only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. That pastor said that it was ignorant to th for Christians to think that if there was a God, there would be a place called hell. And that's a common lie today. How could a loving God send anyone to hell? And my first answer is, how could He not? And then I start explaining why. Because He loved you that much and gave you every chance there was under the sun and sent His Son to die for you. What do you think He's going to do if you don't accept Him? Anyone who rejected the law of Moses that we saw from 1 Corinthians 10 died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them? And who has also insulted the Spirit of grace given to you? For we know Him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is the God that the Bible clearly tells us of, which clearly provides a way. And all we have to do is believe. And if you believe, your life will be forever changed. You will be a new creation. You will find joy and peace. One of the seminars I went to said, How can you find peace? Or joy. I can't remember which one it was. We'll go with either one. They work. And the first thing I thought was of Scripture. And I said, you can't find it. Jesus already gave it to you. Just grab a hold of it. It's there. All you've got to do is take it. The offer of salvation has been presented to you. It is a gift of God, not of works. So anyone can't boast it, but God can. All you've got to do is accept it. Believe it. And use it. It does no good to me if you give me something and I don't use it. You have to use it if you really accept it. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 is what Merle closed with this morning. It says, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful so you don't fall. Father in heaven, we do thank you for who you are, that your words are true. We thank you that though we live in a time when people smear your name and preach another gospel, that you're a big enough God to take care of it all. And we thank you for covering us with the blood of Jesus Christ that cleansed us from all unrighteousness, which made us new creations, 
which made us children of the Most High. Oh, fill us with your Spirit, Lord, so that we will be sanctified and become more like Christ. Lord, help us to hunger and thirst for Your Word so that Your Word will nourish us. And we thank You for the living water that Jesus gave us that should flow from us, and we ask for that, Lord. As we die to ourselves, that You will be faithful to create a new harvest, especially in our children, but in the world as well. And we long for the day when Jesus Christ returns. Thank You, Lord, for Your Word. Thank You for Your Son. Thank You for Your Spirit. Thank You that You are the God who is in control of all things. And we give praise, glory, and honor to You. In Jesus' name, Amen.